broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome, everybody, to the joy of SharePoint. Glad to have you guys joining us today on this. Are we summer yet? No, nope, we're still spring. On this balmy spring day, I think we're going to hit 90 in Tulsa today. Um, we're going to be talking about why users go rogue on today's webinar. And I know we're right at the top of the hour, so we'll give it a minute or two for some other folks to shuffle in. Remember, you cannot do SharePoint without caffeine, so please make sure you have a caffeinated beverage of choice in front of you. It's always of primary importance. Sugar helps too if you're not a caffeine person. And I hope you guys are willing to talk with me today. Um, you can either use chat or the questions. Usually questions is a good catch-all. Um, as we talk through the slides today and like what rogue IT or shadow IT means, uh, what it is, what it isn't, um, I would love to hear your experiences. So please feel free to share as we go and we'll talk about it, we'll define it, and we will discuss solutions to it, how to fix our rogue users that are out and about in the environment. And I'll be honest, from an IT perspective, I've been guilty of implementing shadow IT for my own various needs and purposes, but I did it under the umbrella of, I'm testing this, right? This could have broader applications for the company, so I'm just gonna test, test this and see if it works you know, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, right? All right, so we're a couple minutes in, so let's dig it. Let's dig into why users go rogue and then how with Office 365 we can bring them back. Because we all know, uh, I presented on this a um, couple of weeks back at SharePoint Saturday Atlanta, that there are a lot of options in Office 365, right? It's not a cookie cutter solution world that we live in. Yes, our various industries are going to have recommendations. They're going to have requirements. They're going to have certain types of security regulations that say, this is what you use, this is what you don't use. But the great thing about Office 365 is we can encompass all those security necessities into our tool sets. So without further ado, I'll find my button that forwards my slides. What is shadow IT? And I will confess, maybe it's because I'm just kind of a dramatic person, but this is kind of the view I have in my mind when we start talking about shadow IT. I see a ninja creeping through the hallways at work and doing stuff on people's computers, right? But that's not necessarily what shadow IT is. What it is, is when we, as a user, or they, the business users, implement a tool that's not part of the umbrella of tools that IT offers. And there's a reason that IT offers certain tools, right? Because as a service organization in the business, we analyze it, we test it, we see what kind of security is there, uh, what kind of security is not there, right? We plan for the holes, and after that testing and the vetting of a particular application, we roll it out. Some of us do more of that than others, right? It's gonna depend on maybe the size and the industry that you're in. So when we start looking at shadow IT in the organization, we're looking at file sharing apps that aren't approved by the organization, um, using personal email accounts to share information or files. Um, I have seen, I've been on many a client site in my years as a consultant, and I know you guys have seen it too. Oh, well, sometimes if, if um, you know, the attachment's too big because they've locked us down, you know, really tight at work, I'll just go open up my Gmail account and, and send files to whoever I need to. You know, it's really no big deal. I know who they are. Okay. Or uh, how about chatting with our coworkers? or uh, vendors or colleagues on WhatsApp or Slack or Messenger about work-related stuff. And I'm not talking about what Sheila did the other day in the break room. 
I'm talking about processes. I'm talking about work activities. I'm talking about sharing company intellectual property over personal chat applications. So that's what we're talking about with shadow IT and rogue apps. Not talking about people trying to steal stuff. We're talking about people trying to do their job, but maybe not in an appropriate way. That's the heart and soul of shadow IT. So, and this is, again, there's my little ninja guy. I had to find a slide to put him in. I did a blog a couple of weeks ago leading up to this that kind of does a rundown of what we're talking about today. It might be something good you can share inside the company that you work at rather than a slide deck. So if at the end of this, you want something you can take back to your team or your folks, let us know. We can get slides to you or I can get that blog link to you. So the common areas of rogue applications inside the business, typically file sharing apps, meeting apps. That's a good one these days because there's a million of them to choose from. An internal or person to person communication. So let's talk about file sharing apps. Um, hit me up in the questions. Um, I would just be curious if you guys still use FTP servers to share large files with people outside of your organization. I, I would be interested to know. Um, those file sharing apps today that we typically see are gonna be Box or Dropbox. Not that the company's implemented, but that I, Joy Apple, well, I've got this Dropbox account and I know Bob that works over there at Acme Vendor needs this file. So I'll just invite him to Dropbox and I'll share it with them. Google Docs is a big one, or again, just using that personal email address. Fun story, uh, one of our consultants at Pate Group was on a client site, I think last year sometime, and they admitted that, I don't remember if it was Box or Dropbox, contacted them and said, you know, you guys have so many various Dropbox accounts that we see you know, doing business here, you'd really save a ton of money if you just bought like our enterprise solution the guys like we don't we don't use dropbox we'll pick on dropbox we don't we don't use that oh yes you do you as a corporation may not but your employees sure as heck do and that really opened the eyes of the business to say wow we've got people that need to share files and are sharing files we don't know how they're doing it we don't know who they're doing it with. They're just sending stuff out into the wild and there's no security around it. So that's a big one. That's probably the number one shadow IT or rogue app that we see day in and day out within our business organizations. Meeting apps are a big one too. Um, go to meeting, Zoom, WebEx, join.me is one. I think there's a, isn't there a blue jeans? that's out there, there's a lot. I went just Googling around while I was preparing slides just to see if there was like a big one that I was missing and I'm sure there is. Um, but like, you don't know how many articles I saw. Top 15 meeting apps, top 20 meeting apps. Do you need a meeting app? Here's the 50 most popular meeting apps available today and they're free. And I can just go do it as anyone inside the business. And yes, a lot of these are regulated by our IT department. They're here, we're allowed to use them, we have logins and everybody knows about it and that's fantastic. But it's kind of spooky how easy it is for someone just to go set up a meeting app. Is it a breach of security? Mm, I'll leave that to your IT departments and your information security teams to discuss. What may be the larger issue is just pure application sprawl or just opening a window to these domains some may be more reputable than others the ones i've got on the screen are reputable companies we're not worried about those the heart and soul of this though comes down to application sprawl there's so many tools that our it departments have to keep their arms around to do business and to meet our needs so what's one more what's three more what's five more and now you have disparate tool sets being used throughout the organization and your help desk has to be prepared to answer questions on five different meeting applications. 
which let's be honest, except for a few very specific reasons, um, I'll confess, I've used Zoom before because I needed to have more people show up on the screen using the webcam than Teams currently supports. Would I do that as a business need? No, no, I would not. But for a personal use, absolutely. Just some chit chat with friends I haven't caught up in a while. Teams steps in as part of Office 365 and says, let me meet this need for you and your organization. We've got our chat, we've got our meeting spaces inside of Teams that ties into Outlook. It gives us a really great place to do business. It's very, very easy. It supports having the webcam on so you can look in the eye of the person you're having that meeting with. And there's data loss prevention built right into Teams now. So any assets shared in the course of that meeting are safe. It's not going to let us type in the social security number if we've got a policy in place to protect that data. Now maybe they just like WebEx better. Maybe GoToMeeting is just the better meeting tool because we know it and we're familiar with it. Um, but I challenge you to go show them how Teams will record a meeting and save it to stream and instantly, you know, quote unquote, instantly in a few minutes will be transcribed. You've got ADA compliance built right in there. You've got other languages you can have it transcribed in. It starts to bridge gaps and meet needs right out of the box that some of these other tool sets don't have. And we're not having to pay extra for it. We're not having to support one more different application and it's just built right into the licensing, right? That's more than a win-win, that's a win-win-win-win for that situation. User to user communication. This is a big one. Um, I was a consultant for a large oil and gas company um, a couple of years ago, and I was on site for them. I was in the contractor role, right? So I was one of them, but I kind of wasn't one of them. That organization was super uptight about employees communicating with each other um, after hours. Uh, we had an app called Telegraph that we used just for talk, right? Not work communication, just to talk, right? Here's our team. This is where we are. This is how we get to know each other. Um, that organization was very uncomfortable with that situation. But that aside, we're not talking about monitoring monitoring what people are doing in their own time, right? We're not quite to that level of big brother yet in the world, I hope. But what we are talking about when, oh, you're on Facebook? I'm on Facebook too. Let's connect on Facebook. We'll use Messenger. Oh, here's that file I had the other day. I forgot to send it to you while I was still at work. I've seen it happen. I see that happen in WhatsApp quite a bit too. We start to use that to fill the gaps at work for that really quick and instant communication. Again, you know, Teams is kind of becoming one of my all time favorites in the whole wide world. Um, but, you know, Teams meets that need again. I can share files, I can have very instant communication inside of an application that is safe, that's been vetted, that has security built into it. So we see these needs out here and there are solutions. It's just it's gonna take some time to vet it out. And one side of this is, well, what's the big deal? Don't we want our business users to take the initiative? Isn't it great? We tend to look at our users and go, whoo, you know, if we move from SharePoint on-prem to SharePoint online, the links are going to be a different color. I don't know if they can handle that. They're going to freak out. We can't ever change anything. You know what I'm talking about. So isn't it amazing when a department or a team or an individual in the workplace says, I can fix this problem. I'm going to do it myself. I don't need help. I can do it. Okay, yes, that's awesome. I love to find those pockets of ambitiousness in the user community because then I pounce on them and I say, guess what? You're going to be a SharePoint online champion. Guess what? You're going to be my team lead. But going and finding these random apps and implementing them is really not the way we need to encourage that initiative to be taken, right? Our companies produce important information money-making information, job-supporting information. So we have to protect it. We have to look at things like information rights management, 
yes, I will send this contract to my supplier and they can fill it out, but I'm not going to let them download it. Or yes, I'll send this work instruction to the crew that works on the floor of the machine shop, but we're not going to let them print it using information rights management because if they print it, they're going to go back to that copy time and time again and we'll never see when it's updated online. So we start to look at the tools Office 365 gives us, not just the apps, but the policies and the labels and the security management that comes with them. And we can see now how using these rogue implementations of WhatsApp or Zoom could present an open door for a data breach. If my users just have a personal Dropbox account or they're using their Gmail or AOL.com email account, I don't know it's been shared. I don't know that proprietary data has left the organization. Therefore, I can't, it's out, it's gone, right? It has been sent into the void. I used to joke about fax machines. You know, we can lock down printing and screenshots and downloading on the screen, but in this day and age, can you tell an employee they can't bring their smartphone to work? No, I mean, you can. How enforceable is it, right? So, I mean, they could take a screenshot now or a picture of that screen and text it to their closest friends and family. So security is two way. I have to trust the people that are employed, but I also have to be able to trust my tools to help me protect the data. Two way street for sure. So why, why, why do they do it? Why do our users go rogue and turn to the dark side? Why are they implementing Dropbox instead of letting IT know, hey, I've got a file I need to share, my email won't let me share it. Or, hey, it sure would be awesome if I could have a collaboration space with that vendor that we work with. Um, funny story. Let me see, what year is it? It's 2019. So about, ooh, more than 10 years ago, I was a lowly farm admin, junior farm admin for a company that had SharePoint 2007. Holla, if you ever worked with SharePoint 2007. Ah, oh, brings me back to memory lane. And I was running by to talk to some folks that had some questions about SharePoint in general. Okay, awesome. Meet them face to face. They just worked a few hallways away. So I get down there and I'm looking at the screen. They're showing me their SharePoint site. And you know, SharePoint, right? The first thing you do is you look at the URL to see where the heck you are in the environment. I'm looking at that. That's not our that's not our farm. That's not our, that's not our web application. What is, they're like, oh, well, no, no, this is, we, we built this SharePoint. They literally pointed to one of the guy's desks in this big room and underneath it was a server that was running SharePoint Foundation. They went and found out they could run SharePoint for free, figured it out, set it up and had a five man team running free SharePoint so they could work with one of the, uh, sub sub subcontractors for the company um since this is being recorded and we're professionals and all that i can't really say what was going through my mind at that point in time i was screaming in my head for sure i was like but you know we have sharepoint really you know, we already had it we could have already used it yes that's what almost everything in the company runs on but this had been a situation where one person in IT ramrodded SharePoint, built up a bunch of sites and sent an email to the departments and said, here's your SharePoint site, done. That, that was the approach for user adoption and change management at that point in time. So no conversations, nothing. Yeah, you know, here's SharePoint, peace out, done. So why? Why did this department go to the dark side and do their own stand up of SharePoint Foundation? They didn't know. There was no communication. 
um, the top four reasons encompass that and more. Maybe there is a tool there, an FTP site for those folks, but it didn't meet all of their needs or they just don't know that the tools are available. There's been no communication. There's been no level of awareness in the organization that these tools are even out there. And let's be honest, um, the laws of 80-20 pretty much reign supreme in the world we live in. 80% of users are not going to be super ambitious. They're not going to be bold. They don't just go click around to see what happens. 20% of us do. I am a big chunk of that 20%. I've rarely met a button I won't click. And I love to know where links go. Um, I like to know if I see a site out on the internet and it looks like it's one of the old public facing SharePoint sites, I'll go hack around at the URL and see where I can get. Why not? 80% of our people don't do that. So they don't just go explore the app launcher. They don't just open stuff up to see if they can use it. Maybe, unfortunately, there's a bad history. Maybe there was a point in time where IT wasn't necessarily the friendly neighborhood service department we all come to know and love today. Maybe IT just seems a little standoffish. Maybe the users don't know they can approach IT and say, wow, it'd be really awesome if we could automate the onboarding process so we don't have to have our paper checklist anymore. I was just talking with a team this last week that has a paper checklist for employee onboarding. Wow, you mean Flow could help us automate that with SharePoint? Heck yeah. Maybe IT is just really, really busy, right? We wear a lot of hats in the world today. Um, maybe if you're the IT guy, you do Active Directory or Azure AD. Maybe you keep an eye on Exchange Server and SharePoint's other duties as assigned, right? So there's a slow response time, but me as just a user, I know I can go out to the interwebs, find a tool, download it, and I'm up and going in a day instead of waiting a week or so for a ticket to get properly routed and assigned. It's legit, right? Um, those 80% that aren't going to go click around and see that flows there or try to build their first flow or know that they can just go have meetings in teams because that's just part of teams. They're maybe not going to be the pushy ones that are going to come in and say, um, can I have this? Can I do this? Can we talk about this? So they might be just industrious enough to go get that tool and not bother IT that maybe brushed them off the last time. Yeah, we're being quiet today. You're making me nervous. Usually, usually we're deep into the chit chat by this point. Maurice, I know you're out there. Jump in, dude. All right. How about how about we start shining a light? Um, Jason Himmelstein spoke. He gave the keynote at SharePoint Saturday in Atlanta. And he said this line. Um, I should put his name on the slide, but shout out to Jason Himmelstein. He says, what happens when you shine a light into the shadows? They go away, right? So how do we shine that light on the needs that our users have out in the organization? How do we start seeing what they need? <laughs> oh, he said, oh, yeah, been there, done that shadow IT thing, now have to protect against it. Trying hard, it is tough. Yeah, it really is tough. And the needs are really varied. It's the shotgun scatter approach, right? shoot a shotgun at it and the pellets will go everywhere. And that's kind of the scope we're looking at. The number one way you can find out what people need to help protect against that user going out there and installing what they want is to advertise. Um, I know we're not marketing folks necessarily inside of the IT department, but let them know. Uh, create a communication plan. You know what? There's a chance you've had SharePoint online and Office 365 for a year now. But does everybody else know it's there? Has there been a plan put in place to communicate to people? Say, hey, guess what? 
you don't have to do five different things in 10 different places anymore. We've got Office 365. Do you need to automate something? There's an app for that, it's called Flow. Do you need an easy way to track your tasks with your team and your department? There's an app for that too, it's called Planner. Wouldn't it be great to get fewer emails in the day and be able to ask a quick question, get a quick answer and to communicate at a fast pace? Teams, does your meetings, you can see your schedule. You can bring resources that you use from out the entire organization into your team and build out your channels. There's a way to do that. Tell them, tell people what IT has to offer. Uh, let them know the tool sets that are already in use throughout the organization. If you've got a department, maybe HR, they tend to be one of the first ones to start digging into some of this. Do a show and tell, brag on HR. Show the organization ways that certain departments in the company have leveraged the tools that you make available as an IT professional. And I tell you, they're gonna be knocking at your door wanting more. But there's a bottleneck, right? We've already said it takes a while for IT to get a request. So now they're gonna get more requests and, and we're not hiring more people. So now teach them, teach them how to use it. Even if it's as simple as showing them how to do that built-in sign-off request inside of a list and library using Flow, show them. Get, show them how to create a plan and planner. Spend an hour teaching them. And then those requests start to taper off. If you don't have time inside the organization to train, to teach, hey, look, I'm an exchange admin. I'm not a trainer, I'm out, right? Guess what? Joy of SharePoint travels and she trains. So hit me up, right? Let's talk about the training plans that Joy of SharePoint and Pate Group can bring to the table. If you're not ready to have someone sign a check for it, you would be amazed at some of the really good self-service training Microsoft has put out there on support.office.com. They have upped their game in that world. Uh, I got a question here. Are you letting users build their own flows and power apps? Part of me wants to and part of me doesn't. I get that. Users have to change passwords every so many days. Yes, it breaks their flow. Power apps can get out of control. Yeah. Want to have them learn that you worry about it too. Yes. Um, the old school admin in me absolutely hears what you're saying. We really want people to be able to do stuff but it's really hard out the gate to let them do that stuff. Um, I'm, I'm pondering that password thing with flow that has bothered me since day one. Um, you could consider having a process request. Hey, I want to build a flow. Cool maybe uh, have a service account that you can make an owner of that flow. So if, if the user's password breaks, the flow should still keep running. Um, that might be an option. Uh, letting users do power apps. Yes, you're, you're definitely gonna be looking at power app sprawl. Microsoft has made better in the uh, admin portal ways to keep an eye on who's doing what. Flow for sure, I would wanna check myself to make sure I can go to like Power Apps and see all of the Power Apps that have been built. But there's better visibility now. Um, and I would think, I'm just, I'm just spitballing here, but I would think with Flow, you could probably do some good monitoring on like when something is created, um, just to kind of keep an eye on it. It's definitely a catch-22. If you let people do stuff, you know, if you, you build a house and you give your kids their own bedroom and you let them have toys in their bedroom, it's going to get messy. Um, so there's definitely a, a management side of that that does increase your uh, <laughs> your day-to-day -day activities. Another suggestion is go find those power users the few that, yeah, maybe they run with scissors from time to time, but at least they're learning to willing to learn how to use the scissors. See if they'll 
you, what they can do with it. And if those can become your kind of bridge between the business and IT, or at least that department and IT, to be the folks that work with their coworkers to build up these flow or these power apps and can kind of, you know, be the dam to support it, to keep IT from getting flooded out. Just, those are just some top of the head ideas on that. Okay, go to the next slide. All right, talk to the help desk. Do I have any help desk folks out there? I'd be curious to know. Um, the first job I ever had in, a, in the IT world was on a help desk. Um, your help desk knows more about what works and what doesn't work, who works and who doesn't work in your company than probably anybody else. Um, and they see firsthand what people are having trouble with and what they're asking for. If your help desk is getting requests for FTP sites, it's time to talk about externally shared sites with SharePoint Online. It's time to start seeing if we can invite guests into teams to meet that need and not have all these other FTP things out there that are having to be managed. When you mine those help desk tickets, you get the opportunity to approach the business. And if you're trying to repair maybe a previously bad relationship, having someone from IT, and you know, it doesn't have to be you if you're not a people person, you can go find somebody from IT that, that likes to work with people. Engage the business and build that out as part of your communication plan. Hey, finance needed a workflow to approve large line items expenditure. This is how we did it communicate out to the business, these tools are available. And it just becomes this circle of communication, awareness, and bridging the gap of business needs. So talk to your help desk. Hey, what are people asking for help for? Um, do people need to troubleshoot go to meeting? Do they get help desk requests for uh, email attachments not being able to be attached because they're too big? Right? What's going on out there? And then you meet with the business. How does what you have work? What, what doesn't work? You know, we've got this file share out here for some content. We've got SharePoint for some content. You know, we've got these old uh, third party workflows running. How's that going? What works? What doesn't work? What do you wish you could do, but you can't? Man, it sure would be great if we could have a site where our um, stakeholders can all come together and talk about what they do in a given time. Or man, we have this Yammer community out there. It sure would be great if we could extend that and do live meetings and live events and have a place to store files and and send them out to the rest of the business we have this contract process we have to send a contract outside of the organization so we send an email they save it they send us their copy we upload the new copy and now we can't keep track of which one's the most current right what do you wish you could do but you just can't get there today and i tell folks when i'm on site with them whether i'm doing training um deployment planning or maybe I'm there to actually help them start building out their sites and figure out how to manage the documents that we've brought in from the file share. Tell me what your perfect world at work looks like. Now, my disclaimer is I cannot give you perfect, right? That's a high goal. And we may not be able to get to almost perfect today, but tell me what I'm shooting for. Tell me what the goal is. If I know what your idea of success is, then I can start to help you take the steps to get there. But we don't know if we never have that conversation. That's the key piece, meeting with the business and having the conversation. And what about ride-alongs? Um, if I remember the story correctly, ride-alongs started with Harley Davidson um, using that term in business is they wanted to know how people use their bikes, uh, what they liked, what they didn't like, what they wished was better. 
we absolutely apply that to our world. Absolutely. It's one of my favorite things to do is to see how users in other departments work, what they do, what kind of content are they working with? Do they work on that content just inside of the organization, just inside of their department? Or does it need to go to another facility or to a warehouse or to a manufacturing location in another country? How can we help the business if we don't really know what the business is doing or how they do it? So if we go and do a day in the life of HR, a day in the life of the manufacturing department, right? They've got policies and procedures. They've got work instructions. They've got safety manuals. They need to be able to get to it at a moment's notice. How can I know what that needs to look like for them if I have no idea what the environment they're working on looks like, right? Do they have to go halfway across the shop floor to log into a machine that's old and crusty and the, the keyboard, you can't even see it through the cover that's on it, right? What are they having to do in the day? How can we take SharePoint Online or Teams or Forms and make their life better and bring more efficiency to it. We can't until we go out there and work with them, see how they use the tools. And you know, while you're there, you'll probably be like, you know, I saw you just did this thing and you took seven different clicks to do it. Let me show you a faster way. Let me show you something real quick, how that could be better. People love it if you take the time to sit down and have those conversations. And when we start to see how it works, how things don't work, how it could be better, we start to fill in those gaps in the business processes and the existing tool sets and the tool sets that the business needs to really become successful. Gonna go back to my cookie cutter analogy. So Office 365, really it's, it's not a cookie cutter. You know, the number one question I get when I'm on site with my clients and, and my people I work with, when do I use what? Um, this is off the cuff, so I don't have a slide for it. When do I use what? And Office 365 kind of makes that a blurry answer because we come back and we ask, who are you working with? And what do you need to do? So between OneDrive helping us get rid of our personal file shares, um, SharePoint Online, helping us get rid of those massive file share folders that are sitting out there bloated with final copy one, final, final copy three, for real, the final last copy 12, right? Getting that all consolidated into a place where we work with it in place as a single version of truth. Teams and Yammer giving us a platform to be able to talk with the organization as a whole and to business partners outside of the organization. We start to see we have a Swiss Army knife at our disposal. So SharePoint continues to be that big blade. It's, it's the big knife in the Swiss Army knife that does a lot of our document management. Uh, we route flow through there for approvals, sign-offs, requests. It gives us a place to have our team calendars. But the tool sets are expanding so much Power apps, right? You can do your asset management. It supports barcodes and labeling. So you see ways you can build things out. It doesn't have to be an Excel spreadsheet that we manage our inventory in anymore, right? We can grow that out to be an app. We don't have to have just a task list in Outlook or To Do or all these other various tools out there to try to manage our work. We can use Planner and use integration across the platform for one-stop shopping. So we see the tool set expanding, which means we have to kind of up our game and stay up on it. If you don't mind the uh, message center in the admin portal, or if you don't have access to it, uh, I encourage you to get on Twitter, um, to keep an eye on things that are changing, updates that are coming along from Office 365. The tools we need are here. They're, they're growing, they're getting better. They're expanding all the time. And it really does help us start to be able to bridge the gap from what we need to do our jobs to doing our jobs successfully. Marie says, I can't wait for bots with email and form parsing. Oh, that would be phenomenal to have a bot that goes out there. And, oh, I see this keyword. 
come over here and uh, just give me the info without me having to go through email. I totally agree. My project manager wants that too. All right. So I'm not going to take your whole lunch hour away if you are on your lunch break today. I uh, just wanted to kind of shine a bit of a light inside of shadow IT. Um, ways we can identify it, mining those help desk tickets, and ways we can alleviate it. If you haven't looked at one little free piece of information before I let you guys go, and you know me, I'll hang out till everybody drops off. So if we want to kind of chit chat unofficially here, we can do that as well. Um, if you haven't looked at Flow lately, actually go to the Flow app. Um, as an administrator now, there are better tools to see what flows are in the organization and who owns them. It's been a giant step forward because used to like months ago, that wasn't there. So I will do a shout out on that. I uh, stumbled upon that not too long ago. I was very pleasantly surprised. But again, thank you for joining. If you don't follow me up on Twitter, I believe that is correct, Maurice, uh, the Flow 2 license. Um, I will confess, I've been a slacker on keeping up on how they've changed the Flow licensing. I can verify that for you if you want me to. Um, it's, it's been interesting how that's evolved. And I'll use that word neutrally. But yeah, feel free. If you have any questions, hit me up on Twitter, shoot me an email. Uh, we will have the recording of this available um, for anyone that wants to go back and watch it or if you think it'd be worth a share with a colleague or coworker, please feel free. And please feel free to ask any questions. I've got my calendar blocked off for the hour, so I will be happy to hang out here, answer questions, share stories. <laughs>